I feel almost overwhelmed by the assignment given me, uh, holiness and the cross. Uh, what an assignment, what a, what a privilege, uh, but what a responsibility. It led me to think back about my days in college, which is a very long time ago. And I was thinking, um, maybe you can think about this from your days in college or high school. Can you remember a single sentence that any of your professors ever spoke to you? As a professor, I found that thought alarming. But I did remember one sentence from a rather liberal theologian, interestingly enough, Robert McAfee Brown, who once said in class, this is the essence of American religion. I like sinning, and God likes forgiving, and the world is well put together. That statement has stayed with me over the decades. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. The world is well put together. I'm afraid he was right. That that tends to be the American attitude. And the tragedy of this attitude is that it trivializes everything. It turns me into a naughty grammar school kid and God into an indulgent grandfather who thinks we're kind of cute in our naughtiness. And that's just a profound lie, isn't it? It's a complete misrepresentation of who we are, of what sin is really all about, and most importantly, of course, it's a lie about who God is. John Calvin, there, I've done it. John Calvin <laughs> begins his institutes by saying the essence of true religion is to know God and to know ourselves. If we don't know God and we don't know ourselves, we don't really know anything worth knowing. And if we think sin is just a matter of some sort of cute preference or slightly dysfunctional behavior, and God is just an indulgent God in heaven, then we have really trivialized reality and life. And of course, we have, haven't we? Look at the churches, not just the bad churches, but look at the good churches where the sermons have become trivial and the prayers have become trivial and the songs have become trivial. And we've forgotten the words of Spurgeon. It's two good quotations. Spurgeon who said, sermonettes are for Christianettes. <laughs> and we're developing a country full of Christianettes. It's a tragedy. And that's why R.C., almost 25 years ago, found such a resonance with a book on the holiness of God. Now, if you saw, I think it's still the latest issue of Time magazine. John Calvin made it. Time magazine, I'm still holding out for the cover in July. <laughs> Luther was on the cover in, for, in uh, 1983 for his 500th birth, and I'm holding out for Calvin. Write your friends at Time magazine. Insist on equal treatment for our boy. But there is a picture of Calvin inside Time magazine under this theme, young, restless, and reformed. I feel sort of old, retired, and reformed, but nonetheless, uh, and with wonder, the editors of Time magazine are saying, people are rediscovering Calvinism, it seems, because they feel some need for God. And so I want to look into the scriptures with you this morning to get some sense, again, of the holiness of God the sinfulness of man, and the seriousness of salvation. And where better to begin than with Isaiah 6? Now, I think it's more than audacity to come to the Ligonier Conference and speak on Isaiah 6. 
It's just plain foolishness. But nonetheless, try as I might, this was the text that I kept coming back to. And so I sat with fear and trembling Thursday night, wondering where R.C. was going to begin, but he has kindly left me this text. I think he wrote it. <laughs> I want to approach Isaiah 6 from a slightly different angle than it's usually approached from. And uh, we'll see what the uh, exegetes think of this approach later. Isaiah chapter 6, the remarkable opening verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I think most of us, certainly I, for many years when I read this verse, just rushed right past that opening phrase in the year that King Uzziah died. Many commentators treat it just as a date, calendar mark. Uzziah died early in Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah's just making the point that early in his ministry he had this vision. That's certainly part of what it means. Others have uh, treated this as kind of a general principle. I remember vividly going to church the Sunday after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and Carrie N. Wisiger III preached from this text. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he said, the death of great men is an occasion for reflection and an opportunity to see God. That's true, but it's not what this text means, I think. I think we'll be greatly deepened in our understanding of Isaiah 6 and as we move on, uh, Isaiah 53, if we pause for a moment to think about the reign of King Uzziah. Now, confessions are good for the soul. When I first thought about the reign of King Uzziah, I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> but you can read about King Uzziah in Second Chronicles 26. You don't really need to turn there. I'll summarize it for you. But if you don't trust me, you can turn there. King Uzziah, Second Chronicles 26, is described as a king of Judah who was a good king. You know, in the Kings, they always begin with a kind of summary statement that doesn't just describe the beginning of the reign, but it's the evaluation of the whole reign. He was a good king as kings go. He reigned 52 years and uh, begins by telling us of all the wonderful things he accomplished, how he built cities, how he conquered enemies, how he encouraged technological de development of his military, how the wealth and herds of his people increased. He was a good guns and butter president, king. They had it all. He was a good king. He seemed to be living out the meaning of his name in Hebrew, the Lord is my strength. We're told the Lord gave him success. The Lord prospered him. The Lord helped him. By the Lord, he achieved great power. But, almost always a but, in light of all that success, all that accomplishment, all that blessing, we're told he became proud. Here's the whole history of God's people in a nutshell in the Old Testament. When they suffered, they complained. When they were prosperous, they forgot. Uzziah prospered and forgot that all that he had was from the hand of the Lord, that all he'd accomplished was from the Lord's strength, the Lord's blessing. He became proud. There's an interesting Hebrew word, proud. It means lifted up. Uzziah became lifted up. Uzziah lifted himself up in his own heart saying, I'm really something, aren't I? 
He became corrupt and faithless, we're told. But we're not left just with this general picture of the problematics of Uzziah's pride. We're given a remarkable and horrifying incident in the life of Uzziah. Uzziah, in his pride, seems to have surveyed the nations around him and discovered that all the other kings were priest kings. They were kings who not only ruled the civil affairs of their land, but they were kings that ministered as priests in the temples of their land. And this meant that all power, civil and religious, was concentrated in their hands as priest kings. And he thought, someone as important, someone as great, someone as noble and successful as I should be like these other kings. I too should be a priest king. Why should the holy place be off limits to me? Am I not as great as the other kings? Am I not at least as great as my neighbors to the north, the kings of Israel? Because we read that early in the reign of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first rebel king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam went into the altar that he had built in Bethel and burned incense before the Lord. He'd functioned as a priest king. And Uzziah says, if it's good enough for Jeroboam, it's good enough for me. He wants to follow the model of those kings of Israel, every one of whom is described in Scripture as an evil king. That's his model. That's his paragon. And so what does he do? In his pride, he marches into the sanctuary of God with priests surrounding him saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He marches into the sanctuary of God and offers incense on the altar of incense before the Lord. He will be priest king. And there at that spot and in that moment, the Lord strikes him with leprosy. And he's rushed out of the sanctuary by the priests. The leprosy appearing initially on his forehead, visibly. And he's rushed off to presumably some palace. And we're told he lived there separate for the rest of his life, cut off from the house of the Lord. And when he died, they buried him with the kings, and they said, he is a leper. That was his epitaph. Not even he was a leper. He is a leper. It's all there is to say about him. So here we have a king that the Scripture is still willing to say, on balance, was a good king. But at the heart of his reign was this terrible sacrilege. And when he died, all they could say was, he is a leper. Now with that story in mind, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year the king Uzziah, that king, that leprous king, that sacrilegious king, in the year that he died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Who has a right to be lifted up in the sanctuary of God? Who has a right to be king in the sanctuary of God? Only Jehovah of hosts. It's the same word, lift it up. Isaiah suddenly sees the true king of Israel there on his throne in the sanctuary, exalted amongst his people, glorious. And it's as if Isaiah is saying to us, think of the comparison between this exalted God and poor little Uzziah, poor little pretentious Uzziah. And the train of his robe filled the temple. There's a king. 
always watch royal weddings. You watch royal weddings from St. Paul's Cathedral in London? I'm a monarchist at heart. <laughs> and one of the things that's always impressive is that um, to watch these trains, when you get the overview camera of the royals going down the aisle with this long train, and some of them are so long and so heavy, you know, that they have to have train bearers, and if the train bearers were to drop the train, the royal would pitch right over on his or her face, because it's too heavy to move. But our God is so glorious that his train can fill the temple, and it doesn't slow him down a bit, doesn't hinder him a minute. It's all pointing to the glory of this king in his temple. And above him stood the seraphim, Seraphim, as a word, is derived from a word for burning. Calvin said, uh, well, the English translation says Calvin said they were sunbeams. Sounds maybe a little light. I think what it really means is sun rays, rays of sun. And yet these rays of sun that surround the throne in the temple are insignificant in their glory and light compared to the Lord himself. And so as these angels fly, and I think these are Presbyterian angels, um, I think they speak one at a time. They don't all speak together. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. His whole temple is full of his glory. Well, not really. Are you paying attention out there? The whole of Judah is full of his glory. No, not really. The whole earth is full of his glory. The temple is a concentration point of God's presence in the earth. And it's a declaration that the glory of this God seen by Isaiah in the sanctuary is in fact the glory of a God, a king who reigns over the whole earth and is majestic in his holiness. And that majesty is so great, the building just shakes at the sound of the praise. My wife used to be a high school teacher in the public schools, and we had to go to a chaperone a dance when we were young. And uh, I grumbled, of course. I'm a very supportive husband. And, uh, uh, we went, and I, I remember standing in the gym where the dance was being held, and I remember feeling my collarbone vibrate to the rock music. It was so loud. Well, here is music that would be worth hearing, but it shakes the building in its glory. And the house was filled with smoke. Why was the temple filled with smoke? Well, the scripture frequently refers to, to smoke surrounding the Lord. We could think of Psalm 97, for example, clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Or we can think of Revelation 15, verse 8, the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues were finished. It, it's a mark of the glory of God. It's a mark, in a sense, of the hiddenness of God, the inapproachability of God, how we really can never see God as he is in himself. But I think maybe there's an illusion here to the altar of incense in the sanctuary, to that smoke that rises from the altar of incense before the Lord. You remember the altar of incense stands right before the veil, and it symbolizes the prayers of God's people going up before God. It, it symbolizes the essence of the temple, which is as a place of meeting where God meets with his people. And, and the holy God comes and, and he sees and he hears the purified prayers of his people as they rise, as the smoke from the altar of incense rises. This is a, a picture of the connection of God and his people. 
And I think this, this smoke in part reminds us that, that those incense fires are burning and that, that beautiful aroma and smoke rises to fill the sanctuary and surround God not only with the praises of the angels but with the praises of all His people. And it's a picture of this fellowship, this blessed fellowship. And then we begin to see how profound was the desecration of Uzziah to come into this place and corrupt it, to mar its holiness. Now, one of the chores of reading the Old Testament is to reading those seemingly endless chapters that tell us all about the exact construction of the temple, the exact ceremonies of the temple, all the details of the clergy of the temple. And now, come on, admit it, we're a little inclined to think, come on, let's get on with it. But every one of those details says, I'm holy and I'm pure, and you don't saunter into my presence. You don't wander into my presence. The temple is the great children's book, picture book of the Old Testament, speaking about how pure God is and how serious He is about His purity and what cost there is for sinners to be able to enter His holy presence. Every detail is a reminder to us we have no proper instincts about worship. John Calvin said on worship, the more it pleases you, the more suspicious you ought to be of it. Now, he didn't say, you notice, the more it pleases you, the less you should do it. But the more it pleases you, the more it makes you feel good, the harder you need to think about it to see if it pleases the Lord. And, and the temple, you see, is constantly saying to us, be aware, be aware, be aware of how serious the Lord is about meeting with us. You remember Aaron's sons who offered strange fire on the altar, Leviticus 10, struck dead there before the altar of incense. That's how serious the Lord is. He's not an indulgent grandfather. So we see a picture of the holiness of God here, and then we see a picture of the sinfulness of man, don't we? Isaiah says, Isaiah 6 verse 5, Woe is me. He gets it. He is overwhelmed. He is humbled. He isn't proud. He isn't saying, I have every right to be here. He isn't saying, I belong in the sanctuary. He's overwhelmed with a sense of his unworthiness as he stands and sees the holiness of God. And then what does he say? For I am a man of unclean lips. Do you know what the lepers had to cry when they walked through the streets of the ancient world to warn people that they were coming to get out of the way, to separate themselves? They had to cry this word, unclean, unclean, unclean. And I think what Isaiah is saying here is, as he hears the seraphim declaring the glory of God and praising His holiness, and as he thinks of Uzziah just dead and buried and that epitaph, he is a leper, I think Isaiah is saying, woe is me, I am undone, for I am a leper. My lips are leprous. I cannot praise God. I cannot enter His presence because I am a leper. Now, I'm not saying this word unclean exclusively means leprosy. It can mean other kinds of 
of, of ritual and moral corruption as well. But I think this is part of what's in mind here. Isaiah, thinking of Uzziah, is overwhelmed with this sense of the leprosy as a sign and a symbol of the sinfulness of the people, the corrupting effects of sin. Leprosy was a terrible disease as it progressed. It destroyed nerves and, and left you numb and increasingly visibly deformed. At least one account claims, I don't know if this is true, one account claims that your fingers didn't fall off, but because of the numbness when you slept at night, rats could chew your fingers off and you wouldn't feel it. If that's not true, it still makes for a good illustration. <laughs> it illustrates the horror of this disease. Increasingly weakened and deformed and corrupted. Increasingly shunned by mankind. Stricken by God. As Leviticus says over and over again of those who are lepers. And this is how Isaiah is analyzing his own sinful condition before the Lord. It's as if he's saying, suddenly I see, Lord, that it's not just Uzziah who was a leper, but I'm a leper. My people are leprous in our pride, in our sin, in our failure to listen to your word, in our failure to follow you faithfully. Oh, Lord, woe is us. We are undone. We are ruined. You know, I don't think it's incidental that the Scripture records that the leprosy broke out on the forehead of Uzziah. Because you remember that the high priest, when he entered the temple, was to wear a miter or a turban, some kind of headdress, and from that was to hang a signet stone, and on that signet was to be inscribed the words, Holy to the Lord. The priest that ministered to God at the altar was to come there at least symbolically clothed in holiness. But Uzziah had come in corruption, corruption of heart, and was then visited with the evidence of that corruption beginning on his own forehead. How dare you, Uzziah? You are no king priest. How dare you desecrate the house of the Lord? And now you see comes Isaiah with a sense of what all that picture of Uzziah's suffering meant for the people of God. And he says, woe is me, I am undone, I am unclean, I am a man of unclean lips. And then as a good Armenian, he says, I will take myself in hand and improve myself. <laughs> no, there, there's nothing he can do, is there? There's nothing he tries to do. He recognizes his helplessness in sin, just the way an ancient leper was helpless in his disease. There was nothing a leper could do to help himself. And so we move on to a picture of salvation, a picture of God's action. Salvation is God's action. Lepers can only be helped by a God who will come to them. And that's what we read of gloriously in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Which altar? There are two altars. There's the altar of burnt sacrifice outside the sanctuary, and there's the altar of incense inside the sanctuary. For a variety of reasons I won't go into now, I'm convinced this is the altar of incense that the coal comes from, that the stone comes from. You see, it's all returning to Uzziah and his sin. 
The place where he stood and sinned is the place where God begins to redeem Isaiah. And so a seraph flies to that very altar, and from that altar takes a burning coal with tongs. As if this was so hot and holy, even the seraph couldn't touch it. And he brings it to Isaiah and touches his lips and says, Now your sin is atoned for. Now your guilt is forgiven. There is forgiveness and there is atonement only in the action of God, only in the mercy of God, only in the deliverance of of God. And here is a beautiful picture of salvation, isn't it? Isaiah standing with nothing to offer the Lord, except as Luther said, two points for Luther, uh, except as Luther said, we have nothing to offer the Lord except our sins. He stands there with his sins, and God takes the action, sending the seraph to bring the coal to touch his lips and say, you're atoned for. Now, normally, we think of atonement relative to the altar of sacrifice. But in Numbers 16, we read at the time of the rebellion of Korah, it was the altar of incense that provided atonement. And I think this is what we see here. God is providing from the place where the sin was committed atonement for the forgiveness of sins. But the healing, according to Isaiah 6, hasn't come yet. It's a wonderful picture of salvation, but the fullness of it hasn't come yet. Look at verse 10. Isaiah's commissioned to go and preach, and he goes the way many preachers feel they have gone, to people who will not listen. Verse 10, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. The time of healing isn't yet. The leprosy is not to be taken from the people yet. Why not? Because God has an agent to send, a servant to send. Isaiah prophesies of that. Verse 13, the nation will be destroyed and cut down like an oak tree, but literally, the seed of holiness in its stump. God's yet going to do something for his people. He's yet going to send that seed of holiness, the seed in the stump of David, the seed who will bring, bring a redeemer and that's what takes us over to Isaiah 52 and 53. There, Isaiah has his great, glorious vision of what that seed will be like, what that servant will be like. And again, Isaiah 53 is a passage of, of such beauty and such profundity and such familiarity that, that we may even be slightly hardened to hearing its, its message, the, the power and the profundity of its message. And so again, I'd like to walk through it with you with Uzziah in the back of our minds. Not because I think thinking about Uzziah in relation to Isaiah 53 uh, exhausts the passage by any means. I'm not even sure it's the, the most important element of the passage, but I think it gives us a different angle on the passage to understand something more of the servant that God sends. The servant we know is our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you know, Isaiah 53 really begins at the end of, verse, of chapter 52 at verse 13. And, and let me read through this long chapter, pausing as we go to, to think a little bit about Uzziah and how he gives us insight into the suffering servant. Isaiah 52, verse 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high 
and lift it up. Not Uzziah. Only great David's greater son is worthy to be compared to the Lord God as the one high and lifted up. Here is a king. Here is a glorious king. Here is a divine king. If he is described in the same language that described the Lord God in his temple. And then if you look down at verse 15, so he shall sprinkle many nations. Here's a priest king. One of the actions of the priest was to take blood in all sorts of circumstances and sprinkle the people with the blood. He did that at the founding of the Mosaic Covenant at Sinai, you remember. But there was a sprinkling of blood annually in relation to the, uh, the Day of Atonement. There was a sprinkling of blood whenever someone claimed to be cleansed from leprosy. There would be a sacrifice and the priest would take blood and he'd sprinkle it on the leper as a sign of cleansing. So here, you see, we're being introduced to God's servant, God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as a priest king. And you see, this is part of why God said in the Old Testament his kings could not go into the temple. Because only Messiah would unify kingship and priesthood. Only Messiah would be a priest king. And Uzziah, by going into the sanctuary, was really proclaiming to the world, I am Messiah. And God said, no, you're not. You're a sinner. We live in a world of people who stand up and say, I am Messiah. Every one of us is tempted to do it ourselves. And to every one except our Lord Jesus Christ, God says, you are not Messiah. You're a sinner. You're a leper. And so here we have a beautiful description of our Lord Jesus Christ as God's own king priest. But then we also read Verse 14 of chapter 52, as many as were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Or if we skip down to verse 3 of chapter 53, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. At least in part, I believe Isaiah 53 was saying, Jesus is our king priest, and Jesus is a leper. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. I'm not saying that is exclusively fulfilled in the idea of leprosy, but I think it at least in part suggests the idea of leprosy. He was despised and rejected with men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with, that word we usually translate grief can also be translated sickness. They're interrelated notions. He's acquainted with the sickness of leprosy. And so we hid our faces from him and despised him as we despised all lepers. Are you beginning to see what it cost Jesus Christ to be the Savior? When we say he's king, that sounds pretty good. Even when we say he's priest, that's pretty honorable. And he is those things. But the depth of our salvation is to be found in the willingness of Jesus to become a leper for sinners, to become a leper for lepers.
surely he has borne our sickness. Now, Jesus wasn't literally a leper, was he? He wasn't literally afflicted with the disease of leprosy. But just as Uzziah, the good king, was afflicted with leprosy to show the people the sinfulness of sin, so in some sense I think we have to think of Jesus as a leper to begin to realize the depths of what it meant for him to take our sins upon himself. We so blithely can say, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we in him might be the righteousness of God, that it seems an easy transaction. How hard can sin-bearing be for the eternal Son of God? We don't really believe that, but we begin to slip into that attitude. It becomes too familiar. What a nice thing the cross is. He did a nice thing that day. And we get, begin to, to lose a sense of the horror of it. He who from all eternity had been seated on the throne of heaven and had the angels surrounding him singing to him, Holy, holy, holy. That one beautiful and majestic in glory and purity, in power and might, that one has become so corrupt that we can't look at him, that we turn our heads away and close our eyes. The deformity is too shocking. The seraphim couldn't look at him because of his glory. And they covered their eyes. But throughout his life, and especially on the cross, we can't look at him. Because of the horror of the sin that he took upon himself. not just Uzziah's leprosy, but the leprosy of every one of his people. Think of the weight of sin added to sin, added to sin, added to sin, added to sin. How long do we have to say that to begin to even approach the burden that he bore? You see, Isaiah 53 celebrates that Jesus became our substitute. He took the sinner's place. He entered in to the place where Uzziah had gone as a leper. We read in 2 Chronicles 26 that Uzziah was cut off from the house of the Lord for the rest of his life. And what does Isaiah 53 tell us? Jesus was cut off from the land of the living. He was separated from life. He was separated from his father. He was separated from his people. He was cut off because he'd become the sin bearer. Verse 4, we read, Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God. Stricken is that word that's used over and over again in Leviticus to talk about lepers. They've been stricken 60 times, that's said in the book of Leviticus. Smitten is another word that's sometimes used relative to those who suffer from leprosy. Again, I'm not saying this exhausts the meaning of these words, but it brings us back, you see, to this context. Jesus, the one afflicted, stricken, smitten by God. 
This is the picture, you see, of what it takes to save sinners, of what it took our Jesus to take our place, what it cost Jesus that we might be healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the only way to forgiveness. And it's in his suffering, in his bleeding, in his dying, in his bearing the wrath of God on the cross, that at last our leprosy is healed. At last our guilt is taken away. At last what was done for us means we have a whole different relationship to God. Now we can call God Father, because in a sense, for a time Jesus lost his Father, speaking metaphorically. Do you begin to see the love of the Savior in this? Do you see the cost of the cross? Do you see what it takes for sin to be forgiven? I like sinning, and God likes forgiving, and so the world's very well set up. What a lie. What a tragic, tragic lie. What a demeaning of the Savior. But how tragically we tend to live like that, don't we? I'm a Christian, so I can sneak in a little sin because it's all been paid for. Yeah, sin upon sin upon sin upon sin laid there on the Savior, on the cross. It's no light thing. It's no trivial thing. When he died, he was buried with the wicked. I think there's maybe even an allusion to Uzziah there. We know there's a fuller fulfillment in being laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. But in a sense, he's buried with the kings of Israel. And when he's buried, the sign reads, in a sense, over Jesus' tomb, he is a leper. Because he bore our sins and carried our sorrows. It's an amazing picture. It's an amazing figure. And at the end of this wonderful chapel chapter, uh, verse 12, actually the, um, maybe the second half of, uh, yeah, verse 12, we return to this theme of Jesus as the priest king Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Here's our king, victorious, victorious over sin and death and the devil, risen to reign forever. He does not remain in the grave as a leper, but he rises now as God's glorious king, as his conqueror, as the one who rides forth as king of kings and lord of lords, conquering and to conquer, to gather his people, to give gifts to men. This is the picture of the resurrected Christ as king and the Christ who is forever a priest king because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and he makes intercession for the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, all his people. He bore the sins. If you belong to Jesus Christ, he bore your sins. He bore them all on the cross. It's a glorious thing, and it's no trivial thing. 
and he makes intercession for transgressors. He not only died once for all on the cross to bear all the penalty, but he ever lives to intercede for you and me. Are you a sinner? It's not a trick question. If you're here and you're breathing, you're a sinner. And sometimes that sin becomes a a huge weight on us as Christians. We may know in our minds that Christ has paid the penalty for our sins, but sometimes our sin oppresses us. And here's a wonderful promise. He ever lives to pray for us. He's always praying for us. His wounds do plead before the throne of grace for us. He doesn't forget us. He hasn't finished his work and moved on. He's praying for us as his people. We need to be encouraged in the struggle for sin that he ever lives to intercede for us. He's our priest king who was a leper but now lives and reigns forever. And the cross, then, stands at the very heart and center of history, doesn't it? It it was prepared for by God through all these centuries, through all these pictures. He knew how stupid we were and how slow we are to believe. He knew that there would be many who wouldn't believe the report, and so with picture and picture and picture, he prepares so that when Jesus is lifted on the cross, we know what it means. And so Jesus, seeing the cross approach, as it's recorded in John's gospel, said, there I will be glorified. Because there I will fulfill history. There I will fulfill the redemptive plan that has been planned from all eternity. There I will pay the penalty of the sin of my people. There I will be glorified because I will accomplish all righteousness and all salvation for my own. There I will atone for sin. And I, when I am lifted up, not in the pride of Uzziah, but in the glory of the Father. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men to me. Have you come? Do you see him? High and lifted up to be sure in glory, but also high and lifted up as a leper, that lepers might come and find life and find hope. David, that great prophet, wrote in Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my plea is for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold upon me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful, for you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Jesus was cut off from the land of the living so that you might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Praise God for our leprous high priest. Let's pray together. O Lord, help us with true faith to realize how great and how awful was the work of our Savior to save sinners. And we acknowledge, O Lord, that in ourselves we are unclean. 
but we are thankful for a Savior whose wounds have healed us, who has borne the full measure of the affliction that we deserve, so that we may be able, not trivially, but boldly as the sons of God, and raise our eyes to your heavenly throne and say, Father, thank you for Jesus. Amen.